So uh, welcome, welcome to the National Academies. And uh, I'm Victor Zhao, the president of the National Academy of Medicine. And on behalf of my co-chairs, Daryl Kirsch and Tom Naska, I'm really pleased that all of you can be here with us today. And I know hundreds of people are, in fact, uh, joining us through the web. Um, so this topic, uh, clinician well-being, establishing as a national priority, clearly is why we're here today. And I will say to you that it's a really, really important topic. It's important to us at National Academy of Medicine. It's important to me personally as a physician who not only have experienced this, but witnessed that in many other people. And of course, it's important to all of you, and that's why you're here today. It's important to our patients. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, clinicians, uh, health professions, nurses, social work, pharmacists, physicians, are all in a team together working around the patients. And of course, when we have our challenges, uh, you can imagine that, of course, the work that we can do will suffer and of course the patients will suffer. So I'd like to welcome all of you and first frame up the issue, but most importantly to tell you what we're doing uh, as a collaborative with many organizations, with us uh, organizing this, but really we are in many ways the serving all of you because it is work that we need to do together to make this, uh, you know, a challenge to address this challenge. So I'm going to start with, of course, this slide, a data, but you can see that we now enter into a world of infographics. And rather than show you slides of bar graphs, and data, of course, you know so well, I'll just say that these are alarming numbers. We have an epidemic of burnout among, of course, physicians, health professions. Here in the physician world, and practice and in training, we have twice the risk of burnout as a general population. And of course, physician satisfaction with work-life balance was one third less than general population. And this is data from Schoenfeld in 2015. Furthermore, the rates of depression and suicide ideation remain alarmingly high as 39 or 40 percent. And of course, we know this is not unique to physicians. Uh, there are high prevalence of symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, emotional exhaustion among nurses, among many others. I was just speaking to a good friend, uh, you know, and uh, he pointed out to me pharmacy, too. So, of course, we all recognize the severity of this problem. And uh, as I said, I will not uh, spend a lot of time with statistics, but more to tell you what needs to be done or what we should do together. Now, in itself, these numbers are alarming as a profession together. But when you consider the impact on patients and society, burnout has been linked to high medical errors, patient dissatisfaction, and a decreased ability to express empathy. Burnout may also result in increased familial problems, stress-related illnesses, automobile accidents, and, of course, substance use disorder. So needless to say, these facts are really, really disturbing, and we must act. And I know all of you have been acting. Our question is, how can we put our forces together, our energy together, to really move forward with even more impact? You know, one of the important papers was published in 2016 at the National Academy's Perspective series is called Breaking the Silence, Culture of Silence. And in fact, Breaking the Stigma. As you can see, it's written by Salwan and Kishore. You're gonna hear later from Sandeep Kishore, who's a member of the collaborative and the steering committee in terms of how to continue to put this forward in letting people know about the problem. This was a critically important paper to me. I was very, very moved by the paper. It's an incredible paper that you must all read. It's about a medical student, Caitlin, 
who took her life in 2013. In this paper, four individuals from surgery, nursing, medical training, and clergy offer personal reflections of what led Caitlin, a young medical student, to take her own life. An excerpt of a suicide note, particularly touching, that she wrote to her parents appeared throughout the paper. So you're going to hear more about the paper today. Sunny Sandeep will tell you about this, but I just want to frame up to see that many of this expression now, people coming out to talk about this, to publish about this, has really now made a big difference because the awareness has to be increased. Because if I would go and talk to anyone or patients, uh, many of them are not aware of this. And I think it is important that we get support from our society, from our community, from all policymakers, and of course from each other. So to the credit of many, many people, oh, something happened. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, you know, there are now a whole body of literature, both in terms of scientific literature, as you see here, and also in the public press now. Burnout at work isn't about exhaustion. It's also about loneliness. And of course, addressing physician burnout the way forward. As a matter of fact, the news and uh, US News Report dedicated a full issue to uh, clinician burnout. So I think we're now beginning to get the visibility and the recognition how important this issue is. Now, there's been a lot written and speculated recently on factors leading to clinician burnout. I don't think we know all of it yet. I think this is just the list you see here. You know, a lot of people put uh, the illness on their work environment, you know, the loss of autonomy, loss of professionalism, a lot of time spent on paperwork, cost containment, productivity, you name it. Other people say, well, there's also issue of a physician, clinician, personality trait that uh, looks for perfection, tendencies, and difficult accepting mistakes and failures. I think what we hear is to have a much better understanding of all this. And it could be very different for different people in different environments. But I would say, as Derek Kerr said many times in our own meeting, uh, the steering committee, etc., if you look at our report on, the IOM report on patient safety. What we recognize is that people do make mistakes, but the system is what fails them. So we need to recognize that we need to create a system that supports our clinicians and our health professionals in the work so that it mitigates or reduces the chance of burnout and other problems. So external factors, internal factors, and many other. So how did this all come about? Well, in December 2015, Daryl Kirsch and Alex Omaya from AAMC came to talk to me, because I was already aware being a physician and having a daughter who, in fact, is finished training, just in practice about this issue. But they implored me about how important this issue is for us to take this on, because many of you who are professional organizations and organizations involved with this, one could look at this issue as, it's your professional problem. It's self-serving, you ask us to fix things, etc. So that we as the National Academy can be that independent body, uh, the neutral body, that can rise above and look at this issue objectively, since this is what we do frequently, but also have the, is a tool, if you will, to bring all of you together to think about solutions, etc. And of course, very quickly, Tom Nasker joined in from, double, uh, from ACGME, and together we begin to identify who the stakeholders who may be interested in this issue, and of course, need to say it's not difficult, right? Lots of people are interested. But it did lead to us to say, let's have a planning meeting together a year ago to get people together to say, is there that opportunity? Is there a need for us to move forward together? And, uh, and if so, what do we what should we do? And this happened exactly a year ago here, and uh, we collected a list of 30, 40 organizations, and of course, 
when we send out the no say, would you be interested? The answer is going to be more than just a yes. It's going to be absolutely. And so we had a great turnout in our first meeting with 37 participants from 30 national organizations, as well as federal agencies, CMS and others, and uh, all interested, ARC interested in this issue. So four, so four objectives were outlined for discussion for this planning meeting a year ago. One is to improve baseline understanding across organizations of challenges to clinician well-being. Second, consider activities currently underway to address these issues. Third is explore opportunities for collaborative engagement. And of course, consider the potential role of NAM leading initiative to address this issue. So after the meeting, we had a lot of phone calls and discussions. And in September, we had a call with the meeting attendees to say, with their support, and their enthusiasm <coughs> to create this collaborative, action collaborative. The Collaborative National Academy is a tool, a means by which we can bring people together and really find ways to interact, think about collaborations, move ideas forward together. And of course, as many of you know, we do also these reports, which certainly could be one of the outcomes of collaborative. So, Consequent to this, we decided that we, in fact, we will have uh, a collaborator. I should mention that at the 2016, uh, July 2016 meeting, uh, we have presentations from individuals from National Patient Safety Foundation, uh, Health Resource and Service Administration, HRSA, CMS, and many others. So it's not just the us talk to each other, but in fact, it is really, really interesting, of great interest overall to our community. Rich discussions revealing many existing efforts that's already ongoing in many organizations to address burnout, mental health, suicide. So the problem is, we conclude, is not lack of concern or any disagreement on the issue, or the lack of will, but rather the need to understand what works and what doesn't work, and of course to get the momentum to take collective action to advance progress. So this consensus in September of a call to convene an action collaborator. So we decided the best way is to use this mechanism as a catalyzed stakeholder engagement, conduct root cause analysis, and possibly lead to a consensus report, as I mentioned, to recommend changes in work life environment, national policies, and of course many others to reduce clinician stress and burnout. So we also identified as initial group of 40 organizations or 30 organizations gaps that we need to fill. So we went forward to create in fact a collaborative that we launched in January 27. Not only with, in fact with uh, the initial group of people who were part of this, but also added uh, many others expertise to this. And in the launch of Collaborate in January 27, which is six months ago, we had a great discussion to create a framework for action with also a special address by the former Surgeon General uh, Vivek Murthy to talk about his own experience and the excitement and the support uh, from, in fact, him and others. So launching this clinical well-being and resilience collaborative, what are the goals? Well, first, we all believe that we still need a lot of work to understand the, uh, across the organization of the why, the how, and what, the challenges to clinical well-being. Uh, we need to learn together, share stories, share lessons, and of course, share the best practices so that we don't want to duplicate, but we want to be able to quickly learn from each other. But more importantly, we need to know what works and what doesn't work. So evidence-based solutions to reverse these trends, leading improvement in cause in patient care by caring for the caregiver. And of course, we need to raise the visibility of this issue to our stakeholders, to the policymakers, to the public, so that change can be made. 
So the leadership team, I've been very, very fortunate. I have to give shout out to Daryl Kirsch and Tom Nasker, who has been just outstanding to work with. They're the experts, and they have been so helpful to my team and to all of us. And of course, we, as I'll talk about, creating a steering committee. But importantly, the collaborative made of 55 participants representing professional organizations, the US government agencies, technology and vendors, healthcare centers, payers, and many others. And here's some examples, or here's a list of our sponsoring organizations, and I won't have time to read through the 55. Suffice to say that many of you who are in this room and those who are on the web and others have been enormously generous with the time and resources to help us move forward, but perhaps most importantly, your knowledge and the guidance of creating this collaborative. Now you notice that in fact, there's not only professional national organizations, but we expanded to IBM Watson, Crico, many others, because we certainly recognize that we need these additional expertise, people who matter, who are actually stakeholders, who can actually help us make a difference. So Agency for Healthcare Research Quality, C Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CMS, Department of Defense, VA, of course, we have Epic and IBM Watson at the table, National Patient Safety Foundations, and importantly, we want to be sure that we have researchers, trainees, and early career professionals as part of our group. This is guided by steering committee, uh, in addition to Darrell, Tom, uh, as you can see the list of people on this, and actually each one of them have a very important role not only in steering the future of this, this uh, initiative, but also leading this working groups. So after a lot of discussion, we say, what are the ways to have work streams to move forward in these specific er in this issue? And of course, we identify four. There could be others, and because a, a collaborative is dynamic, we certainly would be interested in hearing from all of you what else is missing. But you're going to hear today from the steering committee and the co-chairs on research, data, and metric with Steve Bird and Robert Harbaugh. Harbaugh. And in fact, they are very much, of course, looking at the evidence base, the need for information, the need to look at gaps, and to need the four to guide the work. We have messaging and communications, so, so important in trying to get the message out there. Who's the audience? What kind of message? But importantly, we want to create a knowledge hub, a place where everybody can look for answers and interact with each other, et cetera. And importantly, a conceptual model, a model that look at all the components of this uh, issue and understanding the touch points and begin to work towards those various factors. And of course, it's external factors and workflow, critically important issues. And of course, the messenger and communication is led by Neil Gusses and Clifton Knight, a conceptual model by Arthur Hangrer and uh, Lois Nora, and of course, external factors by Pam Cipriano and Daisy Smith. These groups are charged with uh, creating activities and products to really drive uh, the changes and to develop organization principles for the work of collaborative. And as, as I said again, this is the purpose of today's meeting, is in fact for you to be aware of what we're doing and to get your input and your participation. So what have we done in six months? Well, first of all, it's not easy to get such a big group together to think about, but we were just in, really in unison in so many ways. But as a result of this, we're clear in where we want to go, and we have formed these four working groups, but when the work gets out, we have so many people who contact us to say, we want to be part of this collaborative. So in order to make this work, we have actually created the idea of partner organization, network of all of you, many of you in this room, 55 organizations, and believe me, it can keep on going to a huge, but the idea is to be inclusive. We do need a smaller group to work on this with your input, but we want to be inclusive. You, the, the role of network organizations can be actually so powerful, being able to be that network that can not only give us information, 
talk to each other, but help us disseminate that information. These days, we think so much about communication media, right? Putting on a thing on the a web page or publication is simply not enough. We all recognize how the way you push out your information by having people communicate, having followers, and we need a lot of that, and we need all of you to help us succeed. And of course, a lot of foundational work has been put into this in the last six months, review of evidence base and best practices. So I would say that in the mere six months, we have done a lot. Now, our agreement is to do two years of this collaborative, but there's nothing prohibiting us to continue. Although I think it's up to the people who are working, who feel whether there's value in this uh, initiative, and what else should we be doing? I can imagine that we will begin to talk about maybe a study to re-look at recommendations, stakeholders, and others about what we need to do as we begin to learn better. Now, one output of this collaborative is a paper that was published just a week and a half ago, a discussion paper from the group of the people in the steering committee and it's, it's published in our National Academy uh, perspective. Burnout among healthcare professionals, a call to explore and address this unrecognized threat to safe, high quality care. Give a lot of credit to uh, the people on this. You can recognize who they are, and they're all here. I want to thank them. But this is really comprehensive. In there is a chart that talk about research priorities and so many other issues. Let me just tell you what happened. Since this paper was published only a week and a half ago, there's been 498 downloads, 1,700 page views. Average time spent on, the, on, the, uh, time spent on each page is four minutes and 44 seconds. Twitter, 6,000 impressions. On track to be most popular NM perspective. If you just look at two weeks and project into this, this is going to be read by so many people the page views, if you look at our home page, Clinician Resilience home page, the page view today is 16,400, and there's only pages on our site that viewed more during this time period of our home page is about the page called About NAM. So we are on our way, and the fact you're here, I'm so excited because this is, means that there is, in fact, a tension. So today, our vision for a future. Obviously, what we want to do is to be able to come together collectively, powerful, to think about we can put our minds and our resources together to create more knowledge, to create evidence-based solution. But this network that I talked to about, so many of you, can leverage these organizations to improving and implementing some of the changes and improving the environment. And we want to grow the network to create a larger community of empowerment. And ultimately, as Daryl Kirsch said yesterday, it's actually a campaign. Because it's a campaign of change, of culture change, of system change. System that's not only about healthcare, hospitals, but system in terms of environment, where it is speaking to policymakers, to regulators, to vendors but to ourselves and many others. So we are really embarking a really important issue. And I just want all of you to throw in all your energy to support this really, really important initiative going forward. And today is the first stage where we're going public with this. And of course, what we want to do today is to provide the overview, as I try to frame up, as you'll hear from the others, the magnitude, the drivers, effects of burnout, but present the mission goals and progress of working groups. You can hear from each one of them. They've done a lot of work and explore the promising approaches to promoting clinician well-being. But importantly, to engage all of you and to hear from all of you what we can do together. Before I end, I would really want to thank some people. First of course, I've already thanked my co-chairs and steering committee and the sponsoring organizations, the others, participants, and all of you. But this will not happen without some dynamite staff and AM. And I think maybe the secret source of what we have offered is this really amazing staff, led by Charlie Alexander, the program officer. You can see her email. You should all take it down. And because 
We actually will be interested, actually, in particularly the uh, network organizations, as we discussed, to have a liaison person. If you can identify who that liaison person in your network, we want to begin to figure out a way to ongoing, in a dynamic way, uh, communicate and work with you. Kimber Bogart is a senior officer at National Academy of Medicine. She, in fact, is the person who works closely with me. They oversee this with uh, Charlie Alexander. But I also want to recognize, of course, Kira Capellucci, Laura De Stefano, the head of our communications. And Kira is also an important member of communication. Molly Doy, another community specialist. Cheryl Ness, a highly seasoned um, uh, staff, senior staff. She's a director of our board and healthcare services, health and medicine division. She's enormously helpful. And of course, Mariana Zindo, a senior program assistant uh, who's helping us. And of course, being from Duke, she's a Dukey. <laughs> now, we also have the assistant of uh, three fellows. And now, don't say that. I had nothing to do with the selection of Duke engaged fellows, but you can see they're all passionate about this. But I just want to show you they're around. They're really hard at work. Uh, Raj Reddy from the University of Texas at Dallas, Jake Thomas, and of course, Sky Tracy from Duke. They're all spending the summer here working with us on this project, and we greatly appreciate it. And of course, Raj Reddy finished his work, but he's been enormously helpful. So please sign up for Listserv at aam.edu slash clinician wellbeing. And you also have uh, Charlie Xander's uh, email. Please send her the liaison officers. And I would say that I'm really looking forward to, to today. What we hope to do is to do this twice a year to have public meetings alongside with our steering committee meetings and of course our working group. Many people hard at work. And what we want to do is make a difference. And what we want, you want, we want to hear from you is, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing enough to make a difference? How can we do better? I look forward to hearing from all of you uh, for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, Charlie Alexander, you've been well introduced. Come on up here. <laughs>